Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program, Bigger Footprint, Does It Result in a Bigger Bottom Line? Five Key Considerations to Achieve Success, presented by Premier and hosted by Health Leaders Media. My name is Stephen Porter, and I'm editor for Health Leaders Media. I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our program will be 60 minutes in length. The first portion of the program is a presentation followed by question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to review the web conference platform. First, to ensure that you can see all of the content for the event, please maximize your event window. Second, be sure to adjust your computer volume settings and or PC speakers for optimal sound quality. Third, at the bottom of your console are multiple widgets you can use. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation. However, please note that it is likely that your questions will not be answered until the Q&A portion of the program. Should you experience any technical difficulties during today's program and need assistance, please click on the Help widget, which has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. We're very pleased to offer you this free educational opportunity by Premier. Now, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Stephen T. Valentine is the Vice President of Strategic Advisory Services at Premier. He has over 40 years in healthcare business advisory services, strategy, transactions, mergers, physician partnerships, and financial impact analysis, and is Chair of the Board of Orthopedic Institute for Children, a UCLA affiliate, and the Strategy and Finance Committee. Steve is also a board member of Northbridge Hospital Medical Center and has been selected by California Medicine as one of California's top 100 most influential people. He has been interviewed in numerous magazines, published many articles, books, and blogs, and presented to many organizations throughout the U.S. Finally, before we get started, note that an on-demand version of this program will be available approximately one day after the completion of the event and can be accessed using the same login link that you used for the live program. Also, a copy of today's presentation is available in the resource list widget, which is located in the lower left area of your screen. With that, I would now like to pass the program over to our speaker. Great. Thank you, Stephen, and we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome to everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, you can see our agenda here. We have a number of topics we would like to go through, and so I've tried to set them up to give framework and context to our discussion. And as we go through the day, feel free to uh, ask questions uh, as you were instructed. So a key issue here when we try to address is a bigger footprint going to drive bigger profits and enhance performance. We need to know what some of the major drivers are that are causing the consolidation. And we've seen a tightening of the net incomes and revenue pressure. So this has really forced hospitals to look and say, well, maybe we need a partner if we're going to drive greater revenue. So as utilization is shrinking, we see per capita use decline the net income tends to follow because the revenue is down. And the old adage of expenses are variable when volume goes up and fixed when volume comes down holds true. The unpredictable health policy in Washington, D.C. has really caused people to whipsaw as to what do we do? Should we commit to population health, to bundle payment? Are we really going to have more risk payments? Are doctors going to be allowed to own hospitals again? So all of this has created some uncertainty, and when there's some uncertainty, things aren't quite as stable. When you're not as stable, you maybe say, maybe we need a bigger partner or to join something bigger that would give us a little comfort, a safety net, so to speak. Then we would look at pressure to drive costs down further, and this will be one of the key areas we'll need to discuss as we go forward, where we have seen some of the failures in the past of big mergers coming together and we don't see enhanced performance. 
typically they've not been able to drive cost lower. So in today's world and with all the revenue pressure, we must drive our costs down. Costs and time to build population health infrastructure. Many organizations are late to the game in the population health world, so they don't have the infrastructure and may not be able to afford it. By partnering, joining a bigger organization, they would access the population health infrastructure, which can be millions of dollars of investment. So we see that as a driver. We also see delivering better value. In other words, can we get better quality patient satisfaction outcomes, if you will, at a competitive cost? They don't have to be the lowest cost, but at a competitive cost. And there are some organizations that have done this pretty well. In all honesty, many organizations have joined bigger to try to enhance their leverage in the market and get greater price increases and focus on the revenue side of things and not necessarily on the expense reduction side of things. And as I mentioned, we have seen flat to declining utilization. Certainly on an inpatient basis, we've seen the tilt down at the volume soft but we're even seeing a softening now of some of the outpatient services as well. Some of this we can attribute to the new tiered networks. We can see the higher deductible PPO plans that have forced greater out-of-pockets and co-pays and people may be uh, maybe hesitating, delaying, or just not getting outpatient services done. And then, of course, we do see a big driver is many organizations realize they have to grow the population base that they need to serve. So they look to increase access to patients through potential ownership of a health plan, partnering on a health plan. They do look at, and the way we broke this out here was the Medicare Advantage, Medicaid commercial market. So we look at market segmentation. We've seen an uptick in the slow growth in the direct to employer contracting, and we would expect that to continue going forward. So would a partner, a bigger partner, be able to bring to us strength in the health plan arena, strength or knowledge, actually employer agreements, or enhance our access points, which could be the urgent care centers, retail centers, telehealth, and so on. So these key drivers, for some of the consolidation, but also form the bedrock to why would we look at joining a bigger organization? So what I did here was to try to just start you off with a checklist of what should we be doing in 2018 in terms of our strategic initiatives? Because if you're not doing some of these or you're doing them but executing poorly, these might become reasons, too, to look to get bigger. So if you were going to develop criteria or goals to evaluate systems to say, should we be getting bigger, should we join something bigger, we would tell you to at least put on your checklist, are you moving towards population health? Are physicians at the center of your strategy? Do we have alignment? Is the alignment in co-management? Is it in a bundled payment? Is it in some kind of MSSP program? Do you have shared risk with them in some kinds of risk pools? Have you designed care models in response to payment models and incentives? We always think it's uh, difficult to change the care models ahead of the payment models because you're probably going to compromise some of your revenue stream by changing the care models, which would decrease resource consumption if you haven't changed a payment model with incentives so that you can actually try to maintain some financial sustainability by responding to payment models and then the care model design. Then we would look for the clinically integrated networks so this is uh, really compliant to the FTC requirements. But you would have a, let's say, geographically dispersed, broad specialty representation in a clinically integrated network. We would like to see it narrow, meaning tied back to your organization, your health system. And the possibility here would be that you're not able to do a CIN, that you're not big enough, that you're not full service, 
would you be part of a bigger clinically integrated network? And then we'd look to say, okay, are we participating in bundled payments? So while the federal government has kind of taken their foot off the gas, commercial uh, plans have still pursued this, and employers have clearly carved out bundles around certain procedures that they've moved ahead with. We still see ASC imaging, standalone EDs. We still see growth. We have seen recently in the standalone EDs within the last week uh, a recommendation to cut payments on those freestanding EDs. Uh, that may dampen the expansion of the EDs at this point. But ASCs and imaging centers are still growth areas. There are still areas that provide great access points and complement what the population's looking for. Access points, again, being critical. Is, are we really setting up access points? Are they feeding our system? Not that we're going to necessarily drive more and more admissions or inpatient use, but are we going to serve a bigger population base as more of our revenue to the system expands to outpatient services, physician services, not necessarily the inpatient services? And the PAC would represent the post-acute care. So we have seen some opportunity in the continuum of care to reduce expense in post-acute care. Good opportunities there. Clearly today, branding makes a difference. And we see this played out with potentially joining larger systems by being able to co-brand or brand some of their clinical services. So we do think that there will be continued growth here. We do expect that brand to be more and more important. We do think that your brand will be attached to accessibility and quality. But having some kind of brand with single specialty organizations or academic medical centers can be very helpful. You'll need to have a social media plan. And is joining a bigger organization helpful to developing your social media plan? Because nowadays, depending upon what market segment and age group, you would see that social media plays an important contact point, access point for that population. Preparing your physicians for MACRA will be important. It is going to change the way they're paid. It's going to change their behavior, uh, maybe based on some of your new care models and new payment systems that you're pursuing. But it is time to get going on the MACRA uh, change that's coming. And next, you would be moving to probably some kind of value-based care. I'm sure many of you have already done this. And we expect this to continue because once you make the infrastructure investment for value-based care, you will really want more lives in value-based care. Uh, it used to be uh, on a medical group that I was on the board, we used to like to get as much Medicare Advantage as we could. And because of our ability on coding, our infrastructure we had in place, we felt we had really good care model processes we wanted sicker patients because it would drive us more revenue per patient. So we really leveraged our infrastructure to, go, to grow the value-based care population that would absolutely be the best revenue opportunity for us. So if we're thinking about a bigger footprint, what would we really be considering? So you would really be profiling your current users, non-users. These would be patients as well as physicians. Uh, you would want to look at your health plans to see what you do have in terms of where you're getting generated volume. You would want to see the performance of your delivery system. So what are your per capita, per population, inpatient, outpatient services? How big is our physician network and is it performing? Do we have post-acute care services, and how are they performing? So we want to identify any weaknesses that we have if we're looking at this bigger footprint. We may want to acquire organizations, merge with organizations that can really address our gaps. Then we would look at the capacity of both organizations to grow. So if we're going to join an organization, is there really capacity to grow? And we ask that because Maybe you're full. Maybe they're full. 
or maybe we're in the same market and now we're going to have to look at how we're going to deal with capacity or reorganize capacity in the market. Maybe you're one organization that is full that needs capacity and would then look to bring an organization in, increase your footprint, get bigger, but have capacity within the organization. If we then look at the service area healthcare needs, we would always look at a community health needs assessment. Uh, those exist, so all the nonprofits have these. It's always good to take a look at those. And then we would look at capacity to market needs. So a few things that I believe are critical. So when you think about a bigger footprint, if we're going to grow the footprint and we are going to get bigger and we're going to be successful, you must ask yourself, are we essential in the market? We see health systems today shrinking, not getting bigger. And when you look at it, where do they divest? They divest where they're not essential in a market. So what does the word essential mean? Essential is one of those words that in our definition of the market would be do the health plans need you in that market? You're essential to the health plan to sell its products in that market. And I would offer up that if you're looking at a partner or an organization is to get bigger, they must be essential in the markets they're in. So this still underlies one of the real theorems. You must be strong locally. So even though we're in a bigger footprint, we must be strong locally, we must be essential. And where we're not, I think going forward, you will see health systems vacate certain markets where they're just not gonna be essential. They're not a player. And in all honesty, they can't invest enough to become critical in that market. So then when we look at, so what are the market needs? Is there capital? So is there major construction required? Because one fallacy, many organizations look to join into a bigger organization. They think that it's almost a free ride. They're gonna get capital. They don't really have to improve performance and things will get better just due to the fact they've joined the bigger system. The bigger system still views this as you must perform in your market. You must generate an EBITDA that will pay for the capital expenditures you require. So then you would say to yourself, is the bigger system that I would be joining going to operationally improve my performance such that my EBITDA will perform uh, much better and then I can spend money on my capital? And if you're in the population health, as I mentioned earlier, and we don't have a strong infrastructure, is there an infrastructure that we can access through our bigger new sponsor, our bigger partner? And then what are the IT needs? We have begun to see people say, well, I've got millions of dollars coming in an IT. I can't, I can't really afford it. I'll join your system and you'll convert Again, the bigger system is going to say, and we have to find a way to pay for that. So at the end of the day, remember, you still need to perform as an organization. There is still no free lunch. So when we do take a look at maybe where things are going, we really begin to see that you're really going to have to respond to the Medicare population. And we have to look at the demographics. So we have an aging population. The spending's going up. We can't afford it. We would expect more value-based methods of payment coming forward that are going to help slow this trend down. Where the growth is today is in the high deductible PPOs. And what we do expect is that here, instead of capitated models, we do see that these are still going to be some kind of a fee basis, but we might see incentives to hold the total spend down. So you can still pay fee for service, but you stay within an overall spend. But what this is doing too is putting price pressure because for outpatient services, because the co-pays and deductibles are so much higher, people are beginning to price shop more. Truth is, not everybody's a price shopper. There isn't enough out-of-pocket exposure yet to force people to really look hard, to really 
change because of maybe the cost. If the copay in one case is $75, $100 with somebody else, will $25 really move the business? Uh, probably not yet. So we will get there, but I would expect copays and deductibles to go higher. This will put economic pressure on you, as well as if we do look for a bigger footprint, a bigger partner, we would want someone who is well-versed in the PPO world, may have insurance products in this world, and this would be very similar to direct-to-employer contracting. All the same principles would apply to how you would deliver care. So here's an example, too, where the AMA and Anthem are trying to promote high-value care. We would expect this to continue. So in the bigger footprint, does the partner offer some kind of a high-value care response? And so here you can just kind of see some of the factors that go into place. Uh, we don't need to read them all, but we have seen more of an emphasis on accessibility, actionable data, enhancing patient care. People want things tailored to their employers to the employees. Uh, here's another example if we take a look at vitals or health engine. Again, more tools employers are offering to help control the spend, to try to introduce price transparency, and to get people trying to really get engaged, patient engagement in their health care. We expect this to continue. This would be another area that you would want to consider in terms of looking at a bigger footprint and is that partner really engaged in these kinds of new technologies and tools. And then here we've gotten a lot of press lately over the last couple of months, but what people are really after is, is the coding appropriate in the ED? Are we having overutilization of the ED? Yes, we do have overutilization of the ED for a lot of reasons. Could be physician access, could be after hours with a less expensive alternative. MTALA clearly stimulates inappropriate use of the ED. You would have to address the MTALA rules. But the point here that we have to do is we need to respond at the bottom of how are we doing on our coding? What is the accuracy of identifying what's going on? This is important and would be important with a partner in terms of any kind of health plans they offer, direct to employer contracts that they would offer, but they would really need to be able to address the ED use and have less costly alternatives and try to slow down the frequent flyers. So what's keeping CEOs up at night? I've mentioned the inpatient and outpatient volumes being soft or down. Again, driving people to look for a partner. They look to deliver better value with quality and patient satisfaction divided by the cost. The unknown direction from Washington, D.C., as I mentioned earlier. Are you relevant to central in your market? Uh, a new headache that has shown up for the CEOs, we're really beginning to see the retirement of the physicians, nurses, other management. As uh, the economy has improved, people's net wealth has improved. They're beginning to think it's time to retire. They've worked beyond the time they thought they would. So there is a huge change coming. Knowledge management is at risk because we don't have a lot of carry forward. It's not, say, institutionalized within the organization. So here we'll say, so, and this is well worn in the industry, but when you do look at, we are moving from volume to value. Truth is, we're never going to leave one side in the past, the volume. There will always be some volume-driven payment. There's going to be value-driven payment. There's going to be a mixture. We're never going to be in one camp or the other unless you've chosen, primarily as a physician model, to be a capitated HMO plan a Medicare Advantage delivery system, a Medicaid delivery system. But at the hospital level, and mostly in the outpatient services like uh, ambulatory surgery and imaging, you're going to be serving all kinds of different patients, not just one or the other. But as a health system, we're moving to value. 
there will always be some value uh, left in the volume side of the equation. So what is critical in terms of looking at the bigger? So if we're going to have a bigger footprint, we have to really address the issue of greater access points. And you can look at this locally, or you could look at this in a region, or you begin to look statewide. And so here we must have access points, a variety of access points, each designed for a different market segment. So you might find that if you're going to be more successful as an organization with a bigger footprint, can you run these well? Can you make money at these? And are we going to be able to attract, capture a bigger population base to drive more revenue into the system? So a key success point to being bigger and more profitable is going to be enhanced access points. They cannot be run, though, as a hospital department or in a hospital cost structure. These are usually pretty tight margin businesses, and we look at these as building uh, blocks so that we can really kind of funnel volume into the organization knowing that we have to get a bigger population base to offset declines in utilization. On the left-hand side, we've really tried to identify the market segments and the types of payment systems so that you begin to think a lot about market segmentation and designing different access points to the market segment. And here we have the accountable care or the clinically integrated uh, network structure. So we need a continuum of care. And if we look on the right-hand side, this was cornerstone to President Clinton, President Obama's healthcare approach and how they wanted to see healthcare reform, which was essentially to put an accountable health plan, an accountable care organization, or mimic Kaiser Health Plan to say, this is the in infrastructure to a health plan to manage a population. So when we look at ACOs and CIN infrastructure, we think, we gave you the Reader's Digest version, that these are the kinds of components you need in your infrastructure. And if you don't have them, when we think of a bigger footprint, a bigger organization, can they provide these tools to us for our specific market? So that brings us to the next slide. And so on slide 17, you might find that a big CIN organization might have a big region. You might find that you have on the bottom right your own accountable care organization to deliver a certain amount of geography. So the bottom of that triangle, that pyramid, the width of it represents the broadness of the geography served. The ACO would represent that your organization needs to deliver that geography or that population. We might find another partner in close proximity, and their CIN delivers another segment of the population. And then a PHO, yet another partner, might deliver part of that population and geography so that a bigger CIN, be it a bigger health system or academic medical center, can leverage its infrastructure on the right, but have partners underneath that help expand the geography, expand the population, and thereby allow a bigger footprint that you don't necessarily have to own, but you support through the infrastructure in the upper right-hand corner. Then as part of all this population health, we've really seen social responsibility and the determinants enter into the equation. So just kind of quickly, where we have seen many health systems go with this, they really tend to focus on the housing, transportation, food insecurity as really the three areas that health systems have tended to focus their efforts to integrate with their population health. So again, if we're thinking of a bigger partner, we might be looking at what are they doing in the social responsibility world, especially in housing, transportation, and food. So then if we looked, these would be minor issues, but you might say on the left, what kind of tools does this bigger system have? What do I need? What do I lack? And if we look on the right-hand side again, where has the focus been of the organization? 
and you would do a self-assessment to determine what do you need help with. So is it in readmission rates? Is it in your costs or your clinical outcomes? We're trying to line up potential partners and a bigger footprint with your needs so that we leverage and fill the gaps that you have. So what's keeping the doctors up? So your doctors, and this really pertains to those health systems that have employed physician bases. You're going to be at risk for the changes coming in MACRA. So we really need to uh, pay attention to this, the timing we're involved in this, you all know this pretty well by now. So the question would be is, are we in track one? Are we in track two? Are we moving to track two? Would a partner, potential partner, bring us into track two? Do they have some of the alternative payment methods in place that would enable our doctors to move in this direction? So this would be a way to maybe accelerate your employed physician base, really responding to MACRA and being better prepared for it. And all we threw in here was the four different areas that you're going to have to pay attention to. So again, when you consider a, a partner, here would be some areas to ask some questions. So the consumer. So something I think we really need to pay attention to is on the right-hand side, so CDS is saying we are bringing healthcare to where people live and work. That is important. They are driving a wedge in between the patient and the hospital or your health system. You need to partner, leverage, gain technology, health plans, direct to employer, but you need to do the exact same things here. Get to where people live and work. So if we're gonna look at a bigger footprint, and we're going to be successful, we will need strategies of moving into people's lives, where they're living, and where they work. This tells us where the competition's coming from in the future. And we're beginning to see more of this with Walmart and Humana. We saw it with CVS and Aetna, obviously. So uh, the competition is there. What I like on this slide is to always point out Many health systems talk about their vision as being full service. At the end of the day, CVS sees themselves as a full service healthcare organization. Walmart sees itself as a full service healthcare organization. Everybody has different ways of getting there. They don't feel they have to own all of it. They're a little better at partnering where health systems have traditionally been more of a control uh, approach, even though more willing to partner we would encourage when we think of bigger and a, a broader footprint is to partner. You may not be able to capitalize your entire growth and need partnerships to accomplish the bigger goals. So why now with all this consumerism? Obviously we talked about at the front end, higher out-of-pocket costs. So as the more cost sharing, the more people begin to get engaged. In the digital age, you have a lot more access to information much more quickly. The health insurance exchanges help. They put out more information for use. We do have a growing transparency, more websites. Hospitals putting it on their websites, imaging centers. They'll give you their price. They'll tell you when you can get an appointment. They'll give you quality ratings. So I think at the end of the day, when we begin to really see what's going on, the consumer is becoming more engaged especially as they have more out-of-pocket costs. So convenience kind of becomes important. So we happen to be bullish that we need to be very strong with convenience. So does the bigger partner offer greater convenience to grow? Do they look for gaps to fill in which convenience is maybe a strategy that you've not been able to execute as well on? So what do some of the consumers want in terms of wearables? This isn't the most critical thing in the world, but we just thought these would be questions to have a dialogue around some of the systems. If we're going to get bigger, are we going to have these kinds of tools available, ways to connect with the patient? So we still are back to being sticky with the consumer, sticky with the patient. Wearables hooked to a patient portal offer us that opportunity. 
Now we've seen a lot of new entrants coming into healthcare in a much bigger way. So we have Alphabet, which is Google. They have four different subsidiaries moving into the healthcare field. They're very bullish on their technology and databases and ability to process information. Apple has acquired Glimpse. Apple's looking at acquiring medical groups. Apple wants to change the experience that they uh, employees and their dependents have. They're going to look to really apply technology right into the doctor's offices to really make it a better experience. So you've heard about the Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and J.P. Morgan. Again, over a million employees' dependents. So the bigger, broader footprint, this you need to take into account because it will put price pressure on many organizations in terms of trying to drive down costs. So the bigger footprint you're looking at cannot always be revenue driven because there's going to be a lot of cost pressure. So the question is, are these health systems as efficient as they can be in terms of driving down costs? And then again with Verily, so what are they doing in healthcare? You can kind of begin to see here, taking risk for patient population, that's our whole value-based care, trying to drive down costs and applying technology. They've shown their targets are going to be the employer's health plans and government. They really see themselves as able to aggregate and analyze data to get this job done. Amazon, questions are, would they get into the health plan business as we've begun to see the industry consolidate? Uh, this would be an interesting move. But again, what can they do in terms of drugs, prescriptions, that is a big cost. And we should expect to see more from Amazon as life goes forward. And Apple, again, we've kind of mentioned what they're trying to do, but they are doing their AC wellness program. They really are looking at trying to coordinate and navigate care much better. They do want to make their iPhones a much uh, more robust method of communicating with people's health records. If we look at artificial intelligence and we see where things are going, again, we would expect to see more artificial intelligence going forward. What's the relevance here? Being bigger. Is the bigger organization involved in artificial intelligence? Are they experimenting with it? Have they partnered with some of the technology firms to utilize artificial intelligence? Do they have a population health platform that's beginning to build and incorporate artificial intelligence? We know this is where we need to go. Are we beginning to pilot and experiment and see if there's a way for us to engage in this? We tried to give you a few examples here in imaging and cancer and trusted data and the algorithms. So again, what is being done? And you can see in the last one with UPMC, Again, attacking chronic conditions where the bulk of our healthcare spend is, this would be an area of focus for most organizations. Again, put it on the checklist as we look for a bigger platform to really result in bigger profits. So then if we look, and we do expect a lot of the artificial intelligence to come into use in the back office, and in that back office, again, you can kind of identify uh, things that are similar to what big systems are already using. And now you can see these cloud-based platforms. So as life moves forward, we're seeing the cost of entry go down. They're lowering costs, increasing access. We expect more technology engagement from these big firms. Your bigger systems, the question is, are they really implementing? Are they experimenting and piloting with these types of programs? So transparency, we're all aware of some of the governmental programs that are out there in terms of transparency. The question here would be, what is really the most valuable? So when we talked early at the beginning of the slideshow, we talked about brand, brand recognition. So you can see reputation, is really very, very strong, obviously, accepting insurance. So again, if we're going to be successful in a bigger platform, our reputation matters. 
being well uh, connected to health plans and direct to employers matters. Having a broad physician base matters. And of uh, interest at the very bottom, we begin to see the religious affiliation has become less important over time. 10, 15, 20 years ago, the religious affiliation meant a lot more. It has slowly come down due to a lot of changes in the industry, especially around uh, insurance. So what do we know about some of the consumerism? We still see that it's more theory than reality, although we see it's slowly changing. We think as there's more copay and out-of-pocket exposure, the more the consumerism will matter. Also, for a lot of us in the baby boom, we're not really as reliant on a digital form of accessing health care where baby boomers' children and grandchildren are much more engaged in electronically accessing health care, getting their health care, having the information available, and interacting that way. I just threw this up as an example. Just looking at California, I wanted to point out a couple of things. So when bigger and a bigger footprint, you really need to define what is bigger. So what you'll notice in the blue line is the discharge per thousand rate, which is the equivalent of admissions per thousand. And if you go back to the mid 90s, there's been some decline, not huge, but some decline. And then you'll see the patient day per thousand, the green line on top, there's been a pretty fair amount of decline since 1990. So when we look at this at the end of the day, if we see, look at what's happened with length of stay, which is the orange bar at the bottom from the mid 90s, has not really changed much. You might recall there were a lot of experts that said we would double the number of beds we need and we'd be out of beds based on the baby boomers aging and needing more inpatient services. But in fact, we've reduced the need for inpatient services. Doctors and nurses, clinicians have all done their job. So the truth is, if we're going to consolidate or have a bigger footprint, we cannot necessarily define it as more hospitals. Because the truth is, we're chasing a shrinking pie in terms of inpatient use. So this drives home a big point of success. If you want to make more money with a bigger footprint, define the footprint as a population or geography, but you may actually reduce the hospital assets to serve that population to improve profitability. You would look to maybe invest in ambulatory access points to capture the population, but reduce underutilized or underperforming fixed assets. So you might find in a market you now have four hospitals Maybe you need three, so maybe the four become three and we repurpose the fourth hospital. This is not pleasant. Nobody joins a system to be uh, kind of shrunken down and then eliminated because they don't look at the whole pie. They look at it as my hospital, my community, my access to care. And we've obviously seen a lot of uh, consolidation. Updated numbers for 15, 16, 17 actually show a uh, increase in the number of transactions and consolidation. We fully expect this to continue to occur. Some of the major transactions that have uh, come to pass out there is we obviously see now there's a vertical integration. So you see the CVS, Aetna, and the Walmart Humana. We see United Optum and Optum acquiring, say, medical groups now, very aggressive. We see Cigna and they're acquiring Express Scripts. So when we look at what's going on, we also see CHS and Tenet um, divesting. So debt loads become high, maybe not essential in certain markets, maybe not able to execute on their strategy of population health. So it's better to reposition assets to markets where they can be essential and relevant. So we expect both shrinkage and expansion of systems with their footprints to be relevant. I get back to one of the core adages here is going to be relevant in our market. So then when we look at 
some things for alignment. So bigger, better, do things get better? So here's Advocate Aurora Healthcare Emerge. They're looking for, they've stated, enhanced scale. So we look to get better economies of scale. They would like to diversify their markets. The investment bankers, as you know, like to have you as broad a geography as possible. They would like you to be multi-state. So they talk to the bigger systems to be multi-state. It reduces risk. And then we would see greater access and efficiencies come into play, consolidation in some markets. Then you see McLaren Healthcare to acquire MDYs. Why would they do that? Diversifying geography, expanding reach. They want to increase their critical mass, gain economies of scale to plans. Do you merge infrastructures? Diversifying product offerings, so it's a fast way to get additional products to the market, learn from each other, introduce new products, and then again, look to adopt best practices. And I've selected these types of um, examples because people always talk about Wow, we're getting bigger. We're going to have a bigger footprint. We'll be more profitable. But the truth is we still need to execute on all these things. Here we can see HCA Gulf Coast. So they're looking to expand their footprint. They're looking to gain economies of scale. They're rationalizing their services within the market. Greenville, gain economies of scale, expand footprint greater access to combined resources, scope of services. You see some common themes. You see some nuances. So every case, you can't look at one and say this one represents everything. Everything's kind of a one-off, but there's usually some core themes that cut across all kinds of bigger is better. And here I just tried to use a few um, examples that maybe aren't necessarily hospitals, but vertically integrating. The bigger footprint is after capturing a greater population. So this is a case of trying to redirect business back into your delivery system, try to gain economies of scale. Some of these you'll notice, you're trying to get uh, closer to the patient. You're trying to wedge yourself in to where the patient lives and works. So again, just some examples for you to look at of where is our competition? When we say it's bigger, going to generate a bigger profit, we have to also say, where is the competition coming from? And is bigger going to deal with some of these new competitors? And here you see some of the considerations. So when we look at this, you need well-defined goals and compatible cultures. We've really seen, and I've tried to stress today, what are your needs and try to, when you say bigger is better, because better is going to drive better profits, we need to know we have a culture that fits, well-defined goals, and we execute on that. You must be essential in your market. It's a market-by-market -market game, and that's where you're going to win. You must be able to improve your value proposition. Many times people get bigger for the sake of bigger and forget the question of, well, how do we improve our value proposition to the public that the public would in fact use us? You do get, generally, better access to more resources. Maybe it's a bigger GPO, you get a better discount, better discounts with vendors. Do you get knowledge management that can be transferred for pop health, for physician practice management, physician employment, ambulatory operations? And then if we look at enhanced credit rating and access to funding is always important. Some organizations just can't access good credit. So be essential in your market, and that would really be a huge driver, but stick to the plan. If we look at some of the mistakes, we would see that people lost focus on cost reduction. Many times, especially nonprofits come together they're very nice, very cordial. They don't really make some of the tough decisions to reduce overhead, to reduce duplication, to reduce uh, uh, expenses that are unnecessary. So the question here would be is, if we're making some tough decisions, make the tough decisions. We find the investor rounds are maybe a little more 
uh, effective at making decisions moving forward and downsizing, right-sizing, where the nonprofits tend to look at, well, maybe over time we'll just freeze positions, there'll be some attrition and we'll get there. So it's just different cultures, but typically probably a harder look needs to be done in the nonprofits getting in bigger to really take more expense out. Slow, non-offensive decision-making, again, what are we doing for the greater good? Do we take four facilities in a market and really make it three? That is a tough discussion. It never goes well, but at the end of the day, it's probably the right decision that needs to be made. Lose local market focus. Sometimes we centralize so much into the corporate office, we lose sight of what's happening in the local market, and that's where we do need to uh, do a better job of aligning with our physicians, our community resources, and we really need to be appropriate in terms of fitting with the community. And then again, we identified at the front of the transaction all the opportunities. It's time to execute against that plan. Most of the times the deal gets done, people forget all the analysis that was done to get there, and then they kind of start fresh. And then a uh, major reason for failure is we really ignore the cultural differences. You have to accommodate some. You may not be able to accommodate all. Otherwise, we end up with duplication. So kind of in summary, you have positive results when you focus, and you have poor results when you lose your focus. Positive when we really focus on are we essential in the markets we're in, Poor when we don't follow our plan of execution, which should be built around building our relevance in a market. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Stephen for any questions that we might receive. Well, thank you. Uh, this brings us to the Q&A portion of the program. So we would now <coughs> like, you, like to invite you, rather, to ask live questions of our speaker. To submit a question, click on the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. It may be open already and appear on the left side of your screen. Please note that your questions will remain anonymous and will not be viewable by other audience members. It looks like we already have a couple of questions here, so keep sending those uh, my way and I will start asking them here. The first one uh, is, do you see ACOs as a means to be big selectively? Uh, yes, we have seen uh, ACOs. Obviously, you have a network that you can design that can be exclusive or more narrow. We next, actually now are facilitating discussions of mergers of ACOs together to enhance their footprint, get bigger, but they will be selective, and the ACO is being used uh, specifically for contracts with employers direct as well as some commercial plans. And second question here, what's the most effective way to evaluate the life sciences companies in order to decide if they are a good partner to help hospitals achieve some of their strategic imperatives around quality patient care and care redesign? Sure, excellent question and probably the most difficult one to answer. So in the life science world, it's uh, some are proven, some are unproven. This at the system level would probably have to have some partnerships. You could look at some pilots and test what aspects of the life science companies are effective, are they working? You might ask, are they well capitalized? Is it a proven technology? But I would have some pretty strict criteria around your needs to really engage in those discussions with those companies to best um, work with you. And obviously, you kind of want to spread your risk amongst a few versus all in with one, because you never really know where some of these are going to go. And how do you propose to both be convenient and be segment focused while right sizing and limiting cost? fixed costs in particular? Is this purely about investments in technology and AI? Uh, another good question. 
So in this case, think less of the big bricks and mortar buildings. Do think about the technology, as you've said. AI probably will be more uh, applied, if you will, in the pop health care delivery arena in terms of accessing the population. AI will apply to back office. We've mentioned that it's already being piloted in a number of areas. And the right sizing is trying to get the utilization or throughput higher at your access points and certainly into your higher fixed cost delivery points, the hospitals, the post-acute centers. So think of a bigger pyramid, think of a broad base of access points using technology to appropriately guide people into the right level of care. And do you have any comments relating to consolidation within the community health center environment? Uh, what we have seen with community health centers, so I will throw in that bucket um, FQHCs and rural health uh, centers. There are a few companies out there today that are rolling them up. So they're taking over the management, putting them in a for-profit MSO company that's a roll-up. They're managing these clinics, health centers, and we see them trying to uh, apply, if you will, much more rigor, much more IT, and much stronger digital platform in running these centers. So we do see some consolidation, and we do see it uh, in particular in the management arm. Thank you for that. And next question. What opportunities do you see for health systems to partner with nonprofits skilled in addressing the social determinants of health? So we're bullish on this. Uh, many nonprofits already have relationships with a lot of community resources because they've done their community health needs assessments. So they know the organizations. We know that health systems cannot do it all. They are going to become overwhelmed. So we do see trying to partner with the various social organizations, the targeting again around the transportation, housing, and food being the three cornerstone areas. Some of it is of economic help. Some of it is management resource help to these organizations, but also including them in just the communication and access of the continuum of care. So we're bullish. We think it can happen but it does require engagement and obviously some economic support of the health system to these community organizations. And it looks like we have time for just one more question, so I will um, send that your way now. It is, should we expect health systems to divest as much as acquire to improve financial performance? Uh, yes, so it's, I think for many, of the big footprints to become more profitable and deliver to what they've either said to Wall Street or the investment bankers. Some of them will need to shrink some. They will need to reposition assets, meaning get out of some markets where they're just not going to be the player, reposition those assets back into markets where they can be the player. So become more significant and relevant in a market where I'm not essential maybe minimize, partner up with somebody who's much stronger. So I do see a shifting. It's not all just grow, grow, grow. I think you'll shed a few assets on the way and add, asset, add assets on the way as well. Well, thank you for those answers. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for questions. So in closing, we want you to know that your feedback is very important to us. As seen on screen at the bottom of the current slide is a link to the evaluation. A live clickable link can be found in the resource list as well as in the program evaluation widget at the bottom of your screen. And it will also appear in the slide window at the conclusion of the program. We would greatly appreciate your thoughts on our program today. I would like to thank our speaker again for joining us today and sharing his knowledge on the topic. And to our listeners, thank you for all putting aside so much valuable time to watch our program. We hope you found it informative, and we look forward to providing you with other helpful programs in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program. Thank you again for joining us, 
and have a wonderful day.